Simon, thanks very much for coming on the show. If we're looking at Stalin, your books, and I'm just see Stalin's name on these bookshelves. Where, where do we have to, where do we start? Where's the starting point for his rise to supreme power? I mean, Stalin was formed by, by a, series of, a, a series of events. I mean, I mean, first of all, he was filmed, form, formed by his education as a priest. He learnt Russian in the seminary. He went there as the top choir boy with the most beautiful falsetto voice in the choir, which is quite a thought, isn't it? And of course, if he hadn't learned Russian, he was a Georgian, a cobbler's son from a small Georgian town, Gori. If he hadn't learned Russian and proper Russian there, he would never have been able to rule the Russian Empire. So that's the sort of key, that's one key moment. I think a second key moment is when he converted to Marxism and became a master of the underground life, the conspiratorial life, as you might, you might think, as a sort of terrorist and revolutionary. You see, most of the Bolsheviks, most of the Social Democrats, they were very good at writing articles. They were all intellectuals and noblemen. Lenin called them the tea drinkers. They were very good at sitting in cafes and talking about themselves and correcting articles and having terrible feuds about ideology. Stalin could do that too because he was educated, had this good education, but he could also have people whacked. Um, he could arrange a strike. He could arrange an assassination. He could set up a protection racket. He was a master of espionage and clandestine activity. So he could do both things. Not many of the top Bolsheviks could do both. And that's why, you know, Lenin always said, you know, when someone said, but he's had people killed, Lenin said, that's exactly the type we need. And, and this is in Tsarist Russia. This is in Tsarist Russia. He went underground. He had many, many uh, aliases. He left. He sort of, he had lots of love affairs and abandoned everybody. He just lived for the cause. He believed with semi-Islamic fanaticism in, in Bolshevism, in Marxism. And these people, many of them were, had religious educations and they believed that Marxism was a kind of scientific religion, like an alternative religion. Um, so those are key points. And another key point, I think, is his exile to Siberia, where... He gets caught. He gets caught many times. He gets exiled, I think, eight times to Siberia. He escapes eight times from Siberia. But... He's, he, he finds himself in Siberia. I think he's happiest in Siberia, fishing, living with the indigenous peoples out there. And then the revolution happens. And then from 17 to 1953, he's in power. Two formative things, the relationship with Lenin and the revolution. And then the civil war is another completely formative experience because that's when the Bolsheviks, they put on leather jackets and boots and pistols and they basically killed a lot of people, they, 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 they launched a terror on Russia. And then the Russian Revolution became an extremist revolution, or more extremist. And in a, in a, in a fight for succession then, the extremist was always going to win, and Stalin was the most extreme radical of the leadership. So uh, when, war, when war is going on, he's, he's fishing in, in Siberia? Yeah, he's actually fishing in Siberia on his own, um, hating all the other Bolsheviks who were all these... Um, Russian noblemen, Jewish intellectuals, who all of kind of the kind of people he hates, and he's happiest going on long shooting trips on his own. Um, also, um, spending long, long days with these kind of indigenous um, uh, peoples out in out in the middle of Siberia, and of course also sleeping with with very young girls and impregnating them. And so he's living this kind of life in isolation. And it must have seemed like the revolution might never have happened. Um, and, so, and then when, where is he when, it, when the revolution, when the Winter Palace is stormed? Well, well, when the, well, the first revolution's in February and he's still out there and he le immediately leaves and comes back to, to St. Petersburg. And then he meets up, Lenin comes back, he meets up with Lenin. And, uh, Lenin, and, and are they close? Yeah, they're sort of weirdly close. I mean, um, Lenin had sort of taken it upon himself to sort of educate Stalin in ideology and set him sort of jobs to, to write about nationalities and appointed him as nationalities expert. And Lenin recognises that in the Bolshevik leadership, there are only about two top effective people, and that's Trotsky and Stalin. And, you know, and of course, it's, it's quite inconvenient that one's a Jew and one's a Georgian, because this is, this is a Russian revolution. But nonetheless, Lenin appoints them. They are the only two people who, once they've seized power, um, are allowed to come into his office without any appointment. It just tells you all you need to know. But you asked about the October Revolution, and the October Revolution, by then, Stalin is in charge of, you know, has been in charge of Lenin's security. He's an expert at smuggling Lenin in and out of St. Petersburg when they're hunting him down. And he's around that, he's around um, during the storming of the Winter Palace. He's, Trotsky's actually running it. Stalin has other jobs on that night. But he's one of the top five people planning everything. And 
as soon as they sort of get get you know they get power like i said you know lenin says trotsky and stalin they can come into my office at any time they're my two top sort of hatchet men henchmen so what you mentioned the sort of five of them that are planning this is it that the, the the impression you get of the russian of the second russian revolution is that it was the, the communists were just a they were a tiny yeah. tiny little sect and yet they managed to take over the Russian Empire so how yeah. many of them are there at this point working on the ground together in St Petersburg? But there are hardly any Bolsheviks I mean there's something like 10,000 or 20,000 Bolsheviks no one's quite sure but and the actual group of who are actually sort of putting it together are just a few thousand people really but the point is that Lenin had created this, this idea of a vanguard a tiny group of people that could decide everything and represent the proletariat and so this suited these kind of pe these kind of very competent people well. People like Stalin and Trotsky, they could get things done. But you've got to realise that though one thinks of the sort of October Revolution as this kind of mythical thing, storming places and taking over everything. In fact, it was incredibly incompetent. In in history, I think I think who was it? Was it was it was it, was it ne ne Napoleon who just said you have to be? Yes, he said to win battles, you just have to be slightly make less mistakes than the other guy. That's what he said. And it's exactly true. The Russian Revolution proves two things. One is the importance of one man, Lenin, in getting it done, because it wouldn't have happened without Lenin. And so he really changed history at that moment. And the other thing is that they only got it done because they were less incompetent than anybody else. I mean, power was already a power vacuum. I mean, the storming of the Winter Palace, even though the Winter Palace was only defended by a small group of women um, and a few small group of cadets and some teenagers, and the windows were open, the doors were unlocked, they still couldn't storm it. And when they did finally storm it, you know, and Lenin was going crazy saying, why the hell haven't we done it yet? And they said, oh, we, we haven't quite got there yet. And it's only about, it was only across, it was only about a half a mile across town. But when they finally stormed it, they all got drunk on, on the Tsar's amazing um, Chateau Kiem or whatever that amazing wine is. And they got so drunk that they passed out in the cellar. And when the fire brigade arrived to smash the bottles, to stop them drinking it, the fire brigade got down on their knees in the cellars and drank it too, and they got drunk. And yet that was how the Winter Palace actually fell. So it was very different from the Bolshevik fantasy of a sort of heroic storming. But, but once they were in power, you've got to realise that there was a tiny group of people, as you said, and they had this incredibly ruthless idea of how to take power. And it was like they believed in terror. They'd studied the French Revolution. They loved the French Revolution. They saw themselves as sort of Robespierre characters. And they really believed that a small group of people could, could change history, improve the world, affect progress, using terror to remould society. And they really believed that and they were willing to do it. Is there a point that you identify when Stalin sort of abandons any pretense at believing in progress and believing in, uh, in improving the world and, and it just settles down to becoming a kind of thuggish, autocratic thief? I don't believe I don't believe that ever happens. Funny enough, I mean I think that I think because I think when we were taught history at school, we were always taught that Hitler and Stalin were just madmen, and that's a very unhelpful way to t look at them actually. Because if you study Hitler's rise to power, you know he was he was a, a superb people person who kind of won over people, played them off against each other, won over the industrialists, won over the establishment, and in diplomacy he was a very smooth diplomat when he wanted to be. Um, Stalin, the same thing. I mean, he systematically organised to, to win power by charming people, by doing favours for people, by giving people apartments and cars um, in the leadership in the part in the Communist Party first of all. And once he was in power, he worked very hard with kind of on propaganda to promote himself in certain ways. That the man of great modesty, he persuaded everyone that he was, you know, he was the opposite to Trotsky. The other alternative was Trotsky. When he was struggling for power, Trotsky was this kind of incredibly handsome, um, um, barrel-chested, marvellous sort of face with sort of a plumage of hair, who was always kind of walking around in beautiful sort of um, finely laundered um, tunics. And then you had Stalin, very low-key, you know, also done a lot of amazing things in the in the revolution, but just never showed off, you know, sat, didn't want to be at the centre stage, it seemed, you know, and so, and who wasn't a very good speaker, he spoke with a strong Georgian accent. Um, so, you know, very, you know, he, he really promoted himself. So he was a brilliant people person. And when you read all the letters in the archives with him and all the top leadership, there are thousands of these letters, because it was just before telephones became totally secure. 
and, um, and much more widely used. When you read all these letters, which he wrote by hand for hours, you know, you can see he's, he's flattering them, he's charming them, he's offering them things, he's persuading them. So that's, that's, so that's one part of it. The other thing is he always believed in Marxism. Above everything, it was politics, politics, politics. He believed in Marxism. He believed that his destiny was to be the man who made Marxism successful in the world and the heir to Marx and Lenin. And he, he totally believed that. He believed there was no separation between himself and A, Marxism, but B, Russia. And the, that was the other part of his kind of persona because he was born a Georgian. It was the only time in world history that a Georgian could become leader of Russia for various reasons, because of the internationalism of Marxism and, and also just, just because of the sort of extreme situation. There was no, you know, Russia had been destroyed. It was being rebuilt. I mean, you know, 30 years later, 20 years later, he wouldn't have become leader. He'd have died as a tramp in, in Georgia, you know, um, as would Hitler, if, you know, at any other moment in history. Because all of history is just this kind of moment, isn't it? This kind of, this fusion of kind of moment and time, you know, moment, personality and, and opportunity. And... So, yeah, Stalin, I think he always believed in Marxism. Uh, so, so at the moment, so, so Lenin's in charge. They're, they're, well, the Civil War breaks out almost immediately. Yeah. What, what does Stalin do during the Civil War? Well, in the Civil War, he's both a, a, hu a huge um, pain to Lenin because he's, he's constantly refuses to take orders from anybody, including Lenin. Um, he's the sort of person that never takes orders from anybody. He has to be master of everything. Um, but at the same time, he's extremely effective at, if you send him to a town, um, telling him to, to, you know, to stop the rot, take control, find enemies, that sort of thing. He's, he's useful at that. He goes down there, he becomes friends with the army commanders or, en or great enemies with them, you know. But often friends, he creates his own coterie, he executes enormous numbers of people who may or may not be enemies. Um, so he's actually the perfect person for this war. And it's an incredibly brutal war. You know, I mean, something like 10 million people die in it. Um, and what, it, what its real effect is on Russia is that it, it brutalizes the Bolshevik party so that the people who do well, the people who get confidence, the people who get power are these really tough working class commissars, not, not particularly the sort of old tea drinking intellectuals. And so Stalin gathers around himself a kind of coterie of these really tough. And you've seen pictures of them all. They're in tunics, they're in boots up to their knees. They have pistols, um, you know, the leather jackets, all that sort of thing. And that is what that those are the people who now take over Russia. And they are kind of blooded by this. And they're used to, execu to executing huge numbers of people. This becomes very useful later in the 20s when they start to collectivize and they start the terror. Because it's it, the terror, Stalin's terror in the 1930s, jumping ahead a little bit, is literally like a fusion. It's like half the civil war and half the sort of the, the, the strange conspiratorial world that Stalin had existed in before the revolution as an undercover conspirator who trusted no one, where everyone was a traitor, everyone was betraying everyone, everyone was talking to the secret police. You couldn't trust anybody. And those two kind of worlds fused in the terror. And that's you know, to go back to your original, where we started with this, you know, the formation of Stalin, those are the things that formed him. What stage does the succession become an issue? Well, very soon, because there's an attempted assassination of Lenin very early on, and Lenin is then quite sort of damaged in his health. Um, and, the, you know, Stalin has a very good civil war, but Trotsky has a better civil war, because Trotsky is the sort of architect of victory. And it's a fascinating story about Trotsky, because... You know, there's this guy, he's a journalist, you know, and we know about journalists in power um, in England at the moment. But, but, you know, he's literally a journalist who's been a journalist and, and sort of public speaker. And he becomes this military, this, this, he becomes a sort of soldier organiser of victory, um, which is such an unlikely story, you know, considering he's a Jewish, Jewish farmer's son who turned, journal, turned international journalist. But he learns how to organise not just you know not not just propaganda but actual armies and, and and warfare and he wins he really wins the civil war and so he's actually kind of got a big claim claim to the succession and lenin start in the, you know very quickly 1922 lenin starts to have strokes which become you know worse and worse 
And as he does that, he realises that Stalin's too powerful. He's made Stalin the general secretary of the party, um, which is an invented job. I mean, Lenin's really head of the party, but you know, this is the organiser. And Stalin understands that, you know, controlling politics is all about personnel. So he appoints, he starts appointing his people patronage. Russia's always been about patronage, still is, you know. So, you know, he starts to become very powerful. And here's somebody, he's always, he's never too proud to go and talk to somebody, to listen to somebody, to invite them over for tea, to make an alliance. Well, on the other hand, you've got this Trotsky, this kind of flamboyant Jewish, Jewish person. And Jews are uh, very suspicious um, people to Russians. There's still a strong st strain of anti-Semitism, even, even in the Bolshevik party, which is supposed to be so anti that sort of thing. And so Stalin builds a party and Trotsky just builds his own sort of his own profile and is too arrogant, really, to build one. And so when it comes to Lenin's death, um, Lenin dies knowing that knowing that Stalin has got too far ahead and that Trotsky, he tries to sort of bring back Trotsky. It's too late, really. And um, and he knows that it's going to be a fight for the succession between those two. What does Le who does Lenin want to succeed him? Um, no one, because like all great leaders, Mrs. Thatcher, um, Tony Blair, uh, anyone else you care to mention in history, they don't think anyone's good enough to succeed them. And so they want a collective leadership. They want someone who's not going to be as important as they are, who's not going to be as great as they are, because they believe there is no one as great as they are. And so he wants a collective leadership. But he, instead, it's pretty inevitable he's going to get Stalin. And Stalin gradually defeats in the 20s all of the sort of different groups and they're all hopeless po politics, surprisingly, because they spent their whole lives kind of arguing about ideology in the Bolshevik party. But they're all absolutely hopeless at standing up to him. Um, and is it kind of palace politics? I mean, is he, he's sort of outmaneuvering them in, in conference rooms and things in Moscow. How, how, how does he do that? It's all sorts of different ways. I mean, in some ways, it's like it's just personal, old fashioned kind of Tammany Hall machine politics. It's literally like you're coming to Moscow. Um, do you want an apartment? Have you got? Let me. Have you got a nice enough apartment? And then when they arrive in Moscow, he actually turns up and looks at their apartment. Is, is this good enough? Um, have you got a fridge? He, oftentimes he turns up at their apartment. He talks to their wife, and he says, "You don't have a fridge. I'm going to get you a General Electric fridge, American fridge." You know that, that happens many times. Or um, have you got the right cars for you? you no, know, you don't seem to have. Any, you, uh, let me get you. Let me get you. Let me get you a you know a Packard. You know, this sort of thing. So he takes great trouble. Some of it's just machine politics. Some of it is, some of it is real um, ideological politics. You know, he backs Bukharin at one point against Trotsky, and against the Novoyev and against the left. But actually, he's a real leftist. And in the end, he follows leftist policy. He says, this has got to be a real revolution. We've got to collectivize. We've got to industrialize. Um, and some of it is just sort of dirty tricks. You know, it's bugging people's phones. It's um, tricking people, like getting Trotsky to, to miss Lenin's funeral by sort of sending him the, the telegram too late. I mean, any, any dirty tricks, you know, he's quite happy to do anything. And partly it's just personality promotion. It's just him, you know, it's him. He's, he's now a veteran. He's an old Bolshevik. Um, he supports his friends too. Um, so it's a series of things. So although he's never, he, though he never faced an election, he definitely ran for office. He definitely ran for office, even though... Actually, the party was quite a small, um, you know, electorate. But actually, you know, it's increasing all the time. There are sort of a million members pretty quickly because it's the ruling party. Everyone wants to join. So though it's not the whole of the Russian people, um, it's, it's an increasing number of people. And of course, you know, they, they, have to be, they, they have to control the whole population. I mean, there's all sorts of things going on there. Um, and so what, what is the critical moment when he... At what stage does he emerge as the un, uncontested ruler of the Soviet Union? Well, in December 1929, he's he's kind of declared the leader, but really he's kind of been he's been dominant really since since even since before Lenin since 1922 really when Lenin's got ill, and um, and it's kind of less when you look at it it's kind of less surprising. I mean, for outsiders it's terribly surprising um, because. You know, he seems such a dark horse and such an unlikely, you know, they're always more flamboyant people. But actually, they're not particularly talented, these people. You know, everyone always said it's so remarkable that he managed to beat Trotsky, Zinoviev, Kamenev, Bukhari. You know, but actually, these are all kind of what Lenin called tea drinkers. They're all, they're not practical politicians. And as we said earlier, you know, the whole point about Stalin was he, he you know, he could do everything. 
he, he had all the political talents necessary to succeed at that, at that time and place, in that peculiar environment of you know, the Bolshevik leadership. How does he see off Trotsky? Well, Trotsky never really makes a real attempt to really kind of put together a, a kind of full party, you know, get a, a full opposition. And everyone's jealous of Trotsky. And Trotsky offends everybody. Well, at that time, Stalin was just sort of Mr. Humble, you know, very, being very humble and sort of easygoing. And he seemed, seemed like a marvellous antidote to this kind of strutting popinjay. Um, I mean, yeah, Trotsky was the ultimate strutting popinjay, talented, and everyone was wildly jealous of him and wanted to stop him. And he, you remember, he'd only just joined the party. He only joined the party in 1917 as well. He was a Menshevik. So, you know, he really didn't, he never really got a, a, a huge, a huge kind of, faction behind him with any depth and so he was actually very vulnerable and he just refused to sort of fight too he really refused to fight Stalin Stalin just easily just just in the end they just voted him out of as as war as war commissar so the, tro the sort of I think the wars the fight the struggles with the oppositions are kind of exaggerated by the west where we kind of think what an outrage that this kind of this this brute managed to outmaneuver all these these brilliant intellectuals but actually they weren't brilliant they were kind of tedious um, Bolshe, you know, Marxist ideologues, and you know he outmaneuvered them easily. And then what about so after he's named in 1929? Yeah. Uh, the, the 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 terror is 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 that about his own grip on power? Or is that about is that about him organising the Soviet Union the way that he wished it to be organised? Well, it's both. I mean, first of all, he says like you know this is a Marxist revolution. We've got to have a Marxist revolution in the country as well. So he organises collectivization, which is really a war on the peasantry. And, you know, they don't care who dies in it. They, they send people from the towns, like, you know, armed people who look for grain, try and destroy kind of better off peasants, the kulaks. And they form these huge collective farms, which are actually extremely inefficient. But nonetheless, they do it. And it's a kind of war on the countryside. When the if peasants who resist, peasants who kind of burn, you know, who destroy their own um, grain and stuff, they just let them starve. And... So a lot of, a lot of you know, 10 million people die. And if anyone else had been in power, um, I think the Soviet Union would have broken up. But in 1932, Stalin held it together. And then there was industrialization. And this is, too is remarkable. If you think that, um, that in, 19, in World War II, Russia, by, in 1942, in 1942, you know, when you think of Russia as in, in complete collapse, actually outproduced Germany completely. So you know, they, what they did, the costs were unacceptable. The death toll, the terror, everything was horrible. There were, you know, I don't know what, you know, we, the numbers, 20 million people, something like that. But what they achieved was, was, was astonishingly effective. But the terror in the 30s was the sequel to collectivization because during that, during the pressure of collectivization, he, he saw that many of the Bolsheviks didn't have the nerve, didn't quite support him, resented him. And so he decided that he would destroy them systematically. And he was inspired very much by history because Ivan the Terrible did exactly that with his nobility. And Stalin felt they'd become a new nobility. And so he just launched this kind of, this terror. And um, its aim was just to find, find traitors, find enemies, even if, if it was just, they were potential enemies, which is quite a strange thing. You kill people because they could be an enemy. Um, but they literally, they literally said, I think it was Yezhov, who was Stalin's kind of the poison dwarf in charge of the secret police at the height of the terror. He said, it doesn't matter if we kill 10,000 innocent people if we get one enemy. And so they basically did that. And it's the most terrifying story. And is it about Stalin's personality? Definitely. I mean, there would have been mass killings under Trotsky. Um, but but it wouldn't, it wouldn't have been, it wouldn't have taken this, the bizarre form that it took. That was a product of Stalin's personal nature. But did it work? It worked and it worked to a certain extent because its aim was to make sure that if there was a war or another mega, mega crisis, that the Bolshevik leadership would be, would be loyal to Stalin, and his, to Stalin and his leadership. And when it happened in 1941, there was not a whisper. No one resisted, you know, and actually during the war, everyone obeyed Stalin completely. And he, he despite, you know, losses, I think he lost sort of six million men in, two, in, in the first year of the war, in the first year and a half of the war. I mean, no other government in history could have survived or no other leader in history could have survived such disastrous 
catastrophic losses in a war. But no one dared confront Stalin, and so he got away with it and then learnt to be quite an effective commander-in-chief. The Communist Party of the Soviet Union would rather die in a, like refusing to retreat against the Wehrmacht than deal with reporting back to Stalin that they disobeyed orders or... Another thing comes into play, of course, and that's Mother Russia and, the, you know, the patriotism. In Russia, there's this strong patriotism. Stalin, you know, this Georgian internationalist, becomes, A, a Marxist, but his other identity is the leader of Russia. And remember, now he has a Russian name, Stalin. I mean, he's not called Jugashvili anymore. And though he has this strong Georgian accent and he still likes Georgian food and Georgian singing and all those kind of things in his private life, actually, he identifies himself. You know, we talk usually about what do you identify yourself? He identifies himself as a Russian because they are the big power. They are the big empire. They are the big people of, of, of history in his part of the world. And he becomes a czar as well. And he talks a lot about this. It isn't just sort of, you know, just um, a sort of frivolous um, comparison. I mean, he constantly talks about, you know, other what czars did. Um, he talks about how the Russian people need a czar. He talks about how, he, you know, he's going to be that czar. And so he promotes himself, you know, in the sort of great, in the great succession of successful Russian czars, as in sort of Peter the Great and Ivan the Terrible, who actually wasn't successful, but who killed a lot of people to get his way. And he... Um, so, so he really identifies himself as both sort of pope, you know, pontiff of Marxism, but also as Russian, Russian leader. And um, that's a very powerful combination. So is, is his rule ever questioned again after he decimates Russia, the, Russian, the Soviet Communist Party, uh, fights his way through the Second World War? Does any, is there ever a point when his rule is threatened? Well, I mean, there's one moment um, just at the end of June and beginning of July, uh, 1941, where, you know, having staked having staked himself, has staked his entire reputation on the fact that Hitler would not invade now, despite overwhelming intelligence um, that, that, that he would do. I mean, that's really the biggest mistake of his life. And again, you know, no other ruler but him um, would have survived it, and he survived it because he'd killed everybody. But, I mean, it was a colossal mistake to be surprised like that by Hitler. I mean, he'd applied, I mean, he'd applied kind of rational, a rational approach to... To Hitler, he, he'd studied history and he thought that Hitler was a kind of Bismarck character who would follow sensible, sort of sensible rules of statesmen. He didn't, he didn't realise, and he, this was a huge mistake, he didn't realise that Hitler was, a, was what, what Hitler called a sleepwalker, you know, someone, a, a, the biggest gambler in all of history. And so he was surprised. And after sort of a few days of just growing disasters, um, at the, you know, when Minsk fell, um, then Smolensk, you know, he, he lost his, he lost his, um, his nerve. And he, there's a famous scene where he goes into the, the uh, military headquarters and he looks at all the maps and he says, what's going on here? And no one knows what's going on here. And even Zhu General Zhukov um, bursts into tears and runs out of the room. And you know, Zhukov is like the, the toughest man that's ever been made. You know, he's virtually hewn out of granite. So for him to actually burst into tears, you can see that things are pretty desperate. And then Stalin just looks at everyone, everyone's silent, and he just looks at everyone, and he just says, like, Lenin left us a state, and we've just fucked it up. And then he just walks out, and he drives back to his dacha, his country house. And then he sits there for a, few, for a few days. And, I mean, in one way, he's testing people to see if they rebel, because he'll, he, he'll crush them if they do. But he's, I think he also did have a crisis, not, not quite a breakdown, but just a crisis of sort of conscience, needed to gather himself. And then, of course, the leadership go out and say, please come back. And there's that famous moment when they go in there and he's sitting there and Mikoyan says, he looks in his face and he thinks like Stalin's expecting them to arrest him. But instead they say, will you come back as Supreme Commander in Chief and run the war? And he immediately says yes and comes back. And from then on, he's in total charge all the way to Berlin. And as for Berlin, you know, he, um, he looked at Russian history all the time. He always said, when, when Avril Harriman, the, the US ambassador or envoy, said to him, like, congratulations, General Stalin, you know, you've taken Berlin. He said, yes, but Alexander I took, took Paris. I, I love that. I love that yeah. quote. So, so um, and why didn't they arrest him? Because they were so hollowed out. They were so beaten down and traumatised by the terror that they just couldn't bring it. They, they couldn't even talk. They didn't dare to talk to each other, whisper it to each other. Well, one of the advantages of having a terror is that you know, everyone, you've, you've killed all the strong people, all the tall poppies you cut down. 
and also that you know also that you know when you promote when you have a government of very very weak people weak and useless people um you know they don't they're very the whole point of that is that they don't conspire against you I feel the history of our country, all 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 the history of our country, all